Welcome to the Economic and Political History Podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas on the intersection of economics, political science, and history. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Sanford University. And today I have the great pleasure of being with Timur Kuran. He's professor of economics and political science and broader family professor of Islamic studies at Duke University. He's the author of uh, plenty of very interesting books, but of one that is uh, being released very, very soon. It's called Freedoms Delayed, Political Legacies of Islamic Law in the Middle East. We're going to be talking with uh, Timur today about this book and his career. Let me say hi to him. Timur, how are you? Hi, Javier. Good to see you. And thank you very much for inviting me uh, in this program. Thanks a lot for for being with us. And let me start by asking you about your, your origins. Um, we we're talking just before we uh, started recording that I was checking your your website to know more about your your life and you have a Wikipedia page that uh, says uh, a few things about your life and your career. Uh, tell us a bit about that, and I'm going to ask you eventually. I, I I was not aware that you started with Canaro. I want to ask you about that later, but but yeah, please tell us about your background, how you got interested in academia and in the history of uh, of the Middle East. Okay. So I was born in New York, but raised in uh, uh, Turkey. My father was uh, a graduate student in the United States uh, and returned to Turkey to uh, go into uh, academia. So I was uh, I became familiar with academic life uh, very early in uh, uh, in my life. Uh, I uh, was interested in questions of long-term economic development, obstacles to economic development, obstacles to democratization, liberalization, and so on. Even as, as, a, as a child, just when people came uh, and visited, my father and mother would have uh, conversations uh, on these topics. Uh, the role of Islam would often come into the discussion. So I was always... Uh, I grew up being aware of uh, these issues, but without a sense of uh, a solid sense of exactly what role Islam had played, what uh, uh, what uh, through what mechanisms this had occurred. It, so there wasn't. A, the, I, I was curious about it. So uh, as I majored in in economics, I was an undergraduate at Princeton. Uh, took courses on long-term uh, development, uh, political science, history, math, uh, statistics. Then went to graduate school to uh, Stanford for this reason, to essentially study uh, uh, development. I was a, a pretty good student, but something strange happened to me in my second year as I started looking for a dissertation topic. I noticed that all the cool students, all the really the good students were going into what was called mathematical economics uh, then, uh, you know, economic uh, theory, quite technical. Uh, and I was, you know, pretty good uh, at this. And I decided to uh, choose this. Ken Arrow had, had been at Stanford, moved to Harvard, came back, had really come back to return to uh Stanford, when uh, I was a, a student, I had gotten to know him. Uh, we we hit it off. We, we talked about. He was very generous with his uh, time. We talked about a lot of uh, subjects. Anyway, I, I he hired me as a research assistant, and I became his uh, a student. I was delighted uh, by that. Did pretty well in my third year student papers. As one of the papers was going to go into my uh, dissertation. In my fourth year, I submitted it to a journal. Uh, my uh, advisor, Ken Arrow, uh, said, submit it to the AER. It's pretty good. And in fact, I got a revised and resubmit. So I was really on track. But soon after, I found myself in a crisis. 
I was sitting in a math econ seminar, which I went to regularly. I was listening to a paper and it just struck me. I said, this is just so weird. And there's no data here. There are no institutions. It's so divorced from everything I'm interested in. I cannot imagine myself spending an entire career listening to these kinds of papers. I, I realized that I did not like the field. I, w I wasn't interested anymore in all the, the technical uh, challenges that people uh, that got people excited. I didn't even like my own thesis, which was actually going quite well. And my advisor was telling me it was planned as a three paper thesis. And, and Ken one day said, so you can, uh, I think two papers enough. These are, these are rich enough. And, you know, you can go on the market with two papers. Anyway, I, I faced a crisis and I even considered the possibility of dropping my topic, uh, spending time looking for uh, another topic and if necessary, changing my advisor and so on. But anyway, I, I decided to be pragmatic, finish something that is going well, get a job and then think, you know, what am I going to work on, uh, more? I realized that my mistake was that I had not in picking a dissertation topic, I had not looked for what I really considered interesting, what I really considered like a contribution, but I, but I picked something that was popular. I just, you know, became part of a, a fact. Now, uh, anyway, I did, I did stick with it and, uh, I, I finished my uh, thesis in the middle of the, of the year, got a job in Los Angeles as an assistant professor of uh, economics at the USC. And I decided not to repeat the mistake. I said, I'm going to find an additional topic or two to work on. And uh, I will, of course, try to get additional publications from my thesis, which I did. I got, got a couple of uh, uh, papers, but I left it there. I didn't, I could have, you know, pursued that topic and gone further. That is when I came up with the idea of preference falsification. There were many papers that I had uh, seen sitting in seminars using the theory of revealed uh, preference, which didn't make uh, uh, much sense uh, to me. So I developed the concept and, and in fact, I coined the term preference falsification and wrote on that subject. I also started working on this uh, topic that fascinated me even as a kid, the political economy of religion. And it possible effects on long-term economic and political uh, development. Now, as an assistant professor, as I was writing my early papers in these fields, I went to Stanford. Uh, Arrow was uh, very gracious. He came to every one of the talks I gave. I have a couple of years I was there. We were good friends at that point. We, we went to lunches, talked in his office. He invited me to his uh, uh, home, uh, and he asked me one day, why didn't you work on these topics with me? And I answered, you know, I didn't think that the economics profession would accept them. And I just didn't know how to articulate these problems at the time. They were just spinning in my head and I didn't, and it took me, you know, even later after I finished my dissertation, it took me a few months to articulate them. And Arrow said, you know, the department would have welcomed any of your topics now. Many people would have wanted to serve on your committee. I would have enjoyed more than, I, than the thesis you did write, working with you on these problems. And are not being able to articulate the, the problem, not being able to frame the issue is a common, uh, is a common problem. I would have helped you resolve that. That was my duty as, as an advisor. If you had mentioned to develop these ideas swirling uh, in your head, we could have unpacked it and I would have served on your committee with greater enthusiasm uh, uh, than, you know, uh, with, than uh, uh, I had on what you actually uh, worked on. So this was a big lesson that I took from uh, that experience, which is that uh, 
as an academic, you should work on something that you really are excited about. I've always uh, enjoyed working on the topics ever since my experience as a graduate student, where I got frustrated with my topic, I didn't enjoy the sort of talks I was uh, going to and so on. I've always followed my instincts, even if it isn't faddish at the moment. Some of the things that I worked on, including preference falsification, initially there were, there were people who laughed at the concept and had said, you know, this doesn't, was not fitting to economics. When I brought religion into, uh, started working on the economics of religion, the political economy of religion, there were people who said, you know, religion and economics don't, don't mix, that you're going to do this, go to a divinity school and uh, start a career uh, there. So, uh, but of course, political economy of religion is a huge topic uh, at right now. So uh, anyway, there's there's a lesson there, and I'm glad I, I, I learned that lesson early in my career, and I have since uh, then, uh, I have uh, worked persistently on problems that I, uh, uh, I find interesting, problems that I find uh, important, even if initially I'm unable to articulate them all the well, but just emerges in time. Let, let me ask you something about that because and it relates to something that I was thinking since I I knew I was going to talk to you um, because there's something about your your career that I find very interesting, which is that you're highly appreciated in many different communities. So um, I, I first knew about you when I was working in Abu Dhabi at NYU and there everyone like you and thought you did great work in an economics department. Then I started to get interested in, in the Middle East and I was aware that people in the uh, Islamic studies community also thought very highly of you. Then I moved to a political science department and that was also the case. And and that um, that sounds very challenging, right? I don't know many people that have that profile in the increasing tribal um structure of modern academia so um, i was i was wondering about that and and your previous uh answer and and the the, the story that you very kindly shared with with us says a bit about that but i want i want to hear about how you think about the construction of your of this interdisciplinary profile it seems that you had uh, a lot of luck in a certain way also you made very pragmatic decisions how do you think about that from maybe the advisor point of view? Do you talk to your students and you tell them, just follow your passion and hopefully you're going to find a job? I don't know. How, how do you navigate that in, in, in your mind now? Well, in, in retrospect, what I did as an assistant professor uh, was, was very, very risky. I happened to, you said you must have been lucky. Indeed, I was very lucky because when I got to USC, USC was uh, in its golden age and it was led by people who were very interested in interdisciplinary work, considered economics too narrow, were, uh, were hiring people they considered interesting and broad and so on. And apparently that had played a role in their hiring me and it played a role in me deciding to go there because there were people like Richard Easterlin and Richard uh, Day, uh, Jeffrey Nugent, who all had a, had a, had a very, very uh, uh, broad sense of uh, the social uh, uh, sciences and then the, uh, and the place of economics of it. Now, the assistant professors in the who were all uh, ahead of me, who had been hired before, all told me, you know, you should, you have a good, you have a good topic. Your papers are being received well. They're being published. You know, you've had publications in top journals of, of the field. Build on that. Get tenure, and then you can. You know, you can change your uh, your path and do whatever uh, you want. I was not going to have any of that. And I just thought, you know, I'll just do work on uh, uh, work on things that I enjoy and everything will work out. Now, 
I did not know much about academia at all. I didn't know about this intellectual tribalism, and I, you know, I didn't realize that they were going to go to ten people. They would request letters from ten people who would have to, you know, sign off. I'd, you know, I'd say say pretty nice things, and we had to have read my work uh, already. I didn't know who would be invited. Anyway, all that worked out well because apparently the committee that they formed consisted of senior faculty who were, you know, pretty uh, uh, pretty in tune with what I was doing, and they must have invited people who were, you know, uh, who themselves were sympathetic to uh, uh, the sorts of things that I was uh, working on. So I was I was pretty lucky. Now when I advise others to, go to the second part of your question, you know, what do I tell, tell students? I do tell students not to be faddish and I try to discourage them from working on things that, 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 that have, what, uh, work on a topic that everybody else's other students are working on uh, to uh, try to encourage them to be uh, innovative at the same time when they are uh, when they get a job as an assistant uh, professor, I do tell them, you know, what it's going to be like when they come up with their third year review is going to be like, and I do encourage them to build on what they are working on. Now, it could be because they, in my students that worked on topics that um, I think are pretty interesting anyway, I haven't yet faced the uh, issue of somebody saying, well, I don't really like this topic anymore. What should I do? Well, I think I'll, I'll have to place that. If it does come up, I'll have to face it. You know, uh, I'll have to face it then. But, uh, you know, it would depend on the on the individual. I would not encourage somebody to work on something that they really don't like, that they really consider uh, uh, a, a tertiary uh, in importance because they're not going to do well anyway. If you're not interested, if you're always looking at your, uh, looking at the clock as to, you know, when is, when am I going to be, be able to do something that I, that I like, uh, you're not at, we're all top. Right, right. Yeah. No, th thanks a lot for sharing that. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm super interested in this type of conversations. I'm sure that many people can identify and relate to to the story that you just told and, and we could spend hours talking about that but i, I want to get to the book because it's it's a fascinating book the one you wrote and and maybe a good way to start um would be to um realize that it's part of a larger endeavor right so you wrote um, a few years ago the long divergence in which you were trying to um, identify the features of what you call then the economic underdevelopment of, of the Middle East, right? And this one, you argue, is uh, the attempt to to build a theory and, and provide evidence of why there's also political underdevelopment there, right? So my first question for you is about that political underdevelopment. When you tell me about economic underdevelopment, I can perfectly sort of imagine what you mean, uh, but probably it, it's not so easy when uh, when you frame it in the political spectrum. What 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 do you mean by that, and how has that changed over time? Right, I, you make an emphasis on repression and so on. I don't know. I, I want to hear uh, from you what, how you you build conceptually that that idea. So uh, I'm glad you brought up the 2011 book, uh, The Long Divergence, uh, which, is, uh, which, which tries to explain why the Middle East is underdeveloped. And the puzzle there is that the Middle East wasn't underdeveloped. On the contrary, except perhaps for China, it was uh, uh, one of the most developed parts of uh, the world as late as the uh, 16th century, if we look at standards of, uh, of living. Now, when I started that project, I saw the problem of economic underdevelopment to be linked to the problem of political illiberalism in the region or political 
repressiveness in the region. The fact that at the time there were uh, uh, just a couple of democracies or near democracies in the uh, in the region. At, at the moment, by the way, there isn't the entire Arab world plus Turkey plus Iran. There isn't a single uh, uh, democracy at the moment. So things have gotten uh, worse, not uh, better since when I started to work on the problem. Well, anyway, I started working on these problems together and I had a sense that certain institutions had played a role both in economic underdevelopment and in generating and in uh, hindering political liberalization. Uh, as I started uh, started the research, I, I realized that uh, the book would be about a thousand pages. So if I could do these uh, uh, do these together, and of course, a thousand page book, uh, nobody will uh, sit down and uh, read, and it would the the big tome would just serve as a doorstop. So I decided to split the. Uh, project and I decided to start with the problem of economic underdevelopment because I felt I had, uh, for reasons that that you mentioned, I had a better handle on it. And I think it would be easier for people to understand what the uh, what the puzzle is. Now, uh, so I, I published that book in 2011, and uh, a few years later, I, I came back to the project and wrote this the sequel. Uh, this sequel was uh, turned out to be more difficult than the other. I found it more uh, more uh, difficult. The mechanisms identifying the mechanisms was uh, was harder. Now, what was the uh, the puzzle, the central puzzle here that I was uh, trying to uh, resolve? It's that the Middle East today is the world's most repressive region. Uh, it is the least free uh, region. Whether you look at Freedom House data or religious freedoms data or internet freedoms or uh, free speech rankings, you just take, you, there, there's something like 15, 16 different indices that I, uh, that I use in every single one of them. The Middle East is the most repressive part of the world. It is even within the broader Islamic world. It is. It stands out as substantially uh, uh, repressed, substantially unfree. And when I say the broader Islamic world, that includes Indonesia, it includes Malaysia, it includes Nigeria, uh, 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 other countries, Central Asian countries. It includes Azerbaijan and so on. So uh, it is. So something. So, so something is, is unusual about the Middle East. And uh, so that's, if we look at it right now in 2023, the Middle East stands out as a particularly unfree part of uh, uh, the world. But it wasn't until recently, until even the early 20th century, you didn't look at the, when you looked at the Middle East, you said it's a, it's a poor country, but it didn't stand out as particularly illiberal, particularly repressive. You didn't look uh, uh, look there, and uh, if you look at uh, uh, political histories of, of the time, if you lo look at you know accounts political accounts of uh, of the world and comparative politics uh, uh, writings from a century ago, uh, they don't they don't see the Middle East as is particularly uh, repressive. So evidently, the uh, the rest of while the rest of the world has liberalized in various ways, the Middle East has has not. And what is the uh, what is the reason for this? That is the central puzzle of the uh, the book. Let me get into that then, because. Um... Many people would say that the answer to that puzzle is uh, Islam, right? And one of the first things that you do in the book is saying it is actually not, right? And then you come up with, well, your your explanation. 
Why do you argue that is not Islam? So it's, uh, it, first of all, it's, it's not the doctrine itself or uh, the, uh, the Quran, uh, say, as some people point to the Quran, they'll say, well, you know, it's, it's a book that calls for oppression. And so, well, there are certain verses that, uh, that are used to justify oppression. But those very verses have quite liberal interpretations as well. And uh, uh, people have had uh, liberal scholars that had no trouble building from the Quran uh, you know, a recipe for a liberal order, a system in which enforceable laws protect an array of social, political, economic, and religious uh, uh, freedoms. So, uh, so it isn't uh, the, the and, and Islam has been reinterpreted uh, uh, frequently, and it has been reinterpreted radically, as Christianity and Judaism and other religions have. Reinterpretation often takes the form of simply just quietly ignoring and pushing into the background certain verses that are no longer considered uh, uh, reasonable or no longer considered uh, uh, relevant. And the same thing has happened in Islamic law. And among the big changes, for example, is that uh, Islam is Islamic law is uh, has traditionally been highly individualistic. It recognizes only natural persons. I could sue you or you could sue me in an Islamic uh, court. We couldn't sir, sue an organization. An organization has no legal standing. You can sue somebody in an organization that did wrong to you in some court, but the, but there's no concept of a fictitious person like a corporation. Well, corporation, every single uh, predominantly Muslim country now has corporations, uh, both business corporations and profit corporations, various, various kinds of uh, corporations. So, uh, uh, it, 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 and, and there, I can give you many other examples of changes that take place. So, people that say, well, Islam is a, is a, a conservative uh, religion, the evidence does not uh, uh, bear that out. And Islam has, uh, has, uh, has uh, adapted uh, over time when, when there is a, a sufficient need, there's sufficient demand. There, uh, the religion has been reinterpreted, like as with other religions, and there's no reason to think you know, that Islam couldn't be used to justify democracy or justify religious freedoms. And certain people say, "Well, the uh, you know the, the apostasy laws are are uh, 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 justified on the basis of uh, the Quran." Well, there, there's no no uh, uh, clear. Uh, statement in the, in the Quran that uh, uh, that exits from Islam are uh, are banned. That, that in the sense that there is, there's no statement that uh, that suggests that there would be a worldly punishment for that. Now there is uh, there are statements that suggest you will uh, suffer in the in the next world. You'll suffer on on Doom Day if you leave. If you leave Islam, if you stop believing uh, believing in in God, but uh, that doesn't that doesn't call for any worldly punishment, and doesn't mean that uh, people today or any society should block uh, exits from uh, from Islam. There's no statement in in, in the Quran that uh, uh, that can be interpreted as banning uh, uh, blasphemy or that calls for worldly punishment for uh, for uh, blasphemy so uh, so Islam itself uh, is pointing to Islam doesn't uh, doesn't uh, explain uh, the illiberalism what uh, we uh, and also if we look at other religions like Christianity, which is a, a religion that preceded Islam and heavily influenced Islam's uh, uh, development, uh, Christianity has had periods of immense repression. 
like the Spanish Inquisition. Okay, this was done in the name of uh, Christianity, and people were forced to convert. People were prevented from exiting uh, Christianity, sometimes on uh, uh, paying out uh, death. Uh, but Christianity eventually evolved, and Christianity is, uh, in that respect, uh, considerably more uh, liberal. Whether we're talking about the Catholic Church or uh, Protestant uh, churches or uh, or others, so uh, so yes, why hasn't Islam undergone? Even if we accept that at certain times it was interpreted illiberally, why didn't that interpretation change? Why has the Middle East lagged? So, uh, so that still a it's still a puzzle. Now, I'm not saying that Islam has nothing to do with it. I think certain Islamic institutions, uh, or institutions that uh, were became part of the Islamic legal complex or Islamic institutional complex, that uh, they have played a role in uh, in preventing liberalization or slowing it down let's let's get into that then so um, you argued that a good explanation for the puzzle is not islam as a faith but that there were this set of institutional choices that uh, the region took uh, over history that are probably good explanations and you one of the first uh, features that you describe as uh, insightful to to argue that that's the case is the the idea of the waqf and you compare that with corporations and you elaborate on that suggesting that in a certain way that was important for weakening civil society what's what's the story there so remember that a liberal order is a system by which enforceable laws protect uh, a constellation of social, economic, political, and uh, religious uh, freedoms. Now, the protection of these freedoms occurs through institutional checks and balances and uh, civil society. Uh, There have been many paths to a liberal order no two countries followed exactly the the same path, but there are two commonalities. When we look at European liberalization or liberalization in other uh, uh, places that are uh, you know, uh, relatively free, that uh, score considerably higher in freedom uh, indices of one sort or another, First of all, non-governmental organizations play a role. A non-governmental organization is established from below, not by the uh, by the state, to represent the interests of uh, constituent, particular constituency in society, a particular excuse me, a particular uh, uh, subgroup. It gives them political representation. It gives them a collective uh, voice. It gives them a forum for deciding what their strategy is going to be, what they're going to uh, demand. And now the the second, this brings me to the second commonality, which is that liberalization requires the generation and uh, the development of ideologies that justify freedom and the discrediting of ideologies that justify repression, that justify arbitrary rule, autocracy, and so on. Now, uh, if the NGOs play an important role in uh, developing these ideologies and spreading the ideologies in uh, uh, cooperating with other organizations to uh, broaden the ideologies to flesh out their implications and so on. And uh, and when you have NGOs and you have ideologies, these ideologies, you get you get a virtuous circle. And the successes in binding the uh, the state, uh, constraining Leviathan, as it's often said, uh, it becomes a virtuous circle. 
they reinforce each other. As NGOs get stronger, they make it harder for uh, they uh, succeed in uh, in uh, getting laws or instituting laws that will make it harder for the state to prevent the founding of new NGOs or to uh, destroy existing uh, NGOs. Uh, they uh, uh, they uh, spread their as, as they spread the ideologies uh, further. They uh, institute laws in line with the ideologies, which uh, then enables uh, more NGOs to uh, form other segments of society to get organized and start voicing their uh, their uh, demands and are, and uh, deciding what their collective interests are. And uh, then that just feeds into the system and makes it uh, and leads to refinements of the ideology to uh, take into account the interests of these other uh, constituencies. Now, we, we see these, these uh, two things, checks and balances emerging and constraints emerging on the state and civil society uh, uh, developing and these, uh, and these ideologies justifying freedoms, uh, broad freedoms uh, developing. We, we see them uh, happening in some places faster than others. And in some places, uh, you know, like the Middle East, we, uh, uh, they're considerably behind in, in this respect. And uh, so, uh, so that uh, if once we frame the question that way, we we uh, start looking for uh, institutions in the Middle East past uh, that uh, possibly would have prevented prevented uh, these uh, these processes. And prevented such a virtuous circle from uh, emerging. Well, it's uh, so. Uh, what did non-state organizations exist, or did the state just own everything and were all resources under its control? Well, on the contrary, there were non-governmental organizations that were protected by Islamic uh, of law. That were considered sacred, and that the state uh, rarely uh, uh, messed with. And these private organizations that emerged uh, uh, quite early in Islamic history, about a century or so, century and a half after uh, the emergence of, uh, of Islam, these uh, uh, organizations came to control massive resources uh, depending on the city in the in the Middle East uh, it between 40 to 60 percent perhaps 65 to 70 percent of all real estate in cities was owned by walks so this is the term that you use what is a walk well a walk is a trust that is formed under Islamic law to provide a certain service in perpetuity. And this is the, and its assets are considered sacred. Uh, nobody can touch these assets. Islamic courts will, uh, will uh, protect the autonomy of uh, uh, the waq. The waq is supposed to provide a certain uh, service according to the instructions written in its uh, deed. Now, so these are autonomous organizations. They're quite secure, and uh, uh, they control massive resources. But wonder why these NGOs did not, over many many centuries, generate uh, uh, generate. Uh, uh, checks and balances generate ideologies well these organ these walks were uh by law they could the service they provided could be anything uh acceptable under islamic law 
and politics was not one of them. They couldn't, you couldn't put in the deed, uh, you know, uh, uh, you couldn't put put in resources there for people to get together and uh, to finance so meetings by people to monitor what the government is is doing and to uh, act on it if if uh, necessary. That was not not allowed. And the way that and under WAC law, the uh, uh, WAC was managed by a caretaker. And the caretaker was uh, always one person. He didn't have a board of trustees with uh, with rotating uh, members who could bring in new ideas, who could we discuss uh, and who re- represent different uh, different interests. Now there was a single person who served typically for life, and when he or she died, then often that they would appoint their own. Uh, son or, or daughter, usually the son, to take over as the next uh, the caretaker. They, they, were, they were under no obligation to uh, listen to the beneficiaries of the walk, whatever service it was providing. Suppose it was providing uh, 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 the, it was financing a hospital. It, it was under no obligation to uh, provide reports to the beneficiaries, the people in the in the community who were either sick or potentially would get sick and would need uh, treatment in the hospital, uh, they were under no obligation to check with them as to how uh, well the hospital was operating, whether it was uh, you know the physicians were uh, uh, up to date in their medical knowledge, uh, et cetera, whether you know the, the sick people were receiving adequate uh, care. Uh, the uh, a caretaker was under no obligation to provide and, and didn't provide information on the finances of the WAP, you know uh, what was available for uh, for maintenance and so on. WAPs had to were set up were established by a single person. And walks could not merge with each other. This was not allowed. Now, why am I mentioning these? Because this basically uh, made these these walks politically impotent. Walks, we, when we lo- look at Middle Eastern political history, we don't see a single example of a walk-led reform movement in society, or a walk-led. Of course, you have revolts, you know, spontaneous revolts that occur, and there are sultans that are toppled, and uh, uh, people marching to the palace and asking for the vizier's head, and, uh, you know, you do have, you do have uh, uh, political participation generally, but walks are not involved, despite the fact that they are economically such powerful uh, or, or organizations. Also, walks do not produce any, did not produce any ideologies. There's not a single ideology uh, that was, that came out of the madrasas, uh, madrasas that are the Islamic colleges. Uh, These were uh, established starting in the ninth century. So Islamic colleges have a history that go farther back than the colleges in, in the West, whether uh, Bologna or Oxford or one of the early uh, uh, other early uh, colleges, these Islamic colleges come early. They are all financed as a walk, whereas the whereas most of the uh, the colleges in Europe were established as a corporation, or if they were established as a trust uh, with with a with a deed that they had to. Uh, Follow uh, that they have to abide by. They were quickly rechartered as a corporation. By quickly, I mean about fifty years. Now, uh, so the madrasas did not uh, generate new ideologies. Didn't generate any reform movements. Didn't contribute to reform movements because they were essentially frozen, intellectually frozen organizations. They taught what. Uh, uh, what the founder essentially instructed them uh, instructed them to uh, teach, 
and uh, we're not uh, uh, we're not expected to uh, generate uh, new ideas. That, that by that we mean ideas that were not known at the time of the of the founder. And uh, so uh, the civil society remained weak in the Middle East, and the Waqf system was dismantled during the uh, uh, starting in the 18th century and accelerating in the 19th century. The Islamic Waqf doesn't exist anywhere uh, now, isn't an important factor. Uh, new ones are not being formed. There are organizations called Waqfs that exist in some countries, but they're essentially charitable corporations now. So it's a completely the same name, but very different uh, different organization. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to the Islamic uh, walk and uh, and uh, what I tried to explain is that uh, it, uh, it despite its its resources, enormous resources, it uh, did not uh, develop play a role in developing civil society. It did not contribute to developing checks and balances. Now, you might say, well, the WAC has been dismantled, the, the old WACs have been dismantled, and now there's no obstacle for corporations, uh, then uh, uh, the problem must have disappeared. Well, uh, no, there's a legacy of this old institution, which... Uh, uh, played a very important role in the region's history for more than a thousand uh, years. The Middle East entered the modern age with a very weak civil society. Civil society has been developing, but starting from a low base. And because civil society is relatively weak, autocracies have been easy to, uh, to form because they uh, they don't uh, uh, generals who uh, or military officers who uh, who want to take charge don't face uh, substantial opposition. So in Egypt after Mubarak was toppled uh, uh, during the Arab Spring uh, 2000 uh, in 2011, uh, he was replaced soon after by uh, Sisi, about a year and a half after. He was replaced by another uh, general who has been even more repressive than uh, than uh, Mubarak. Uh, this is not because society, there aren't people in Egypt or even the, the majority of Egyptians don't want to be freer it's because they're not well organized, and uh, the crowds that that uh, toppled Mubarak consisted of mostly of disconnected individuals. You did not have organizations that uh, uh, that helped bring about the the huge demonstrations that uh, played a role in these uh, demonstrations. And uh, so when the crowds uh, dissipated, uh, uh, there was no strong civil, civil society that could defend the democracy. It's not by, uh, by coincidence that the only uh, non-governmental organization, strong non-governmental organization in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, was the uh, uh, was able to uh, contest the first election and and win. So there was a there was about a one year Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, government. That was the only organized uh, uh, the, uh, or the or the best organized uh, 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 group in opposition group in in Egypt. And it was able to take advantage uh, of that and uh, win the first uh, election. It also stood as the major uh, 
a major obstacle to the establishment of a new uh, military-run, uh, military-linked uh, dictatorship, which is why uh, Sisi's regime has uh, cracked down massively on the, and very brutally on the on the Muslim uh, Brotherhood. But that's just the, uh, the exception that uh, proved the uh, the rule. There is no with the Muslim Brotherhood essentially uh, decapitated and greatly uh, weakened and forced uh, underground. There's no major uh, uh, opposition movement uh, in uh, in Egypt at the, uh, at the moment. This is a legacy of the long, long history of not having non-governmental organizations that uh, that uh, uh, that give various constituencies a voice, enable them to strategize, uh, give people uh, uh, training in uh, in uh, uh, participating in government, how to form coalitions, how to negotiate with uh, uh, with others uh, politi- politically. This is something that is quite uh, limited in Egypt. The glass is not uh, not empty uh, in the in the region in terms of civil society, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, much less full than is needed for uh, having sustained uh, liberal uh, liberal order. I should point out that the uh, book is called Freedoms Delayed rather than Freedoms Denied. The book does not say that the Middle East hasn't made progress, that it's impossible for the Middle East, for the liberalism and as many people argue that liberalism is just incompatible with the Middle East. No, the Middle East is is better off than it was 120 years ago because it has certain components of liberalization. Now, I can mention some, some others uh, later. But one of them is it does have the ingredients of a strong civil society in that you had in that... Uh, uh, individuals and groups can establish non-governmental organizations as corporations, uh, and non-governmental organizations do exist even in a very repressed uh, country like uh, like Egypt. They're just relatively weak at the moment. So, in addition to this. Um weak civil society and the long-term effect of, of the wax, you also mentioned that there were two big additional elements that have contributed to uh, keep um, the, the region uh, politically underdeveloped or with these high levels of, of repression. One makes reference to what you call the lack of an liberal Islamic schism, right? And, and the other one makes reference to um, a sort of a weak uh, economic governance. I think you prefer to use the word shallow, right? What are yeah. these uh, two features and how do they complement and reinforce the, the force of, um, of the civil society that uh, is not strong enough to oppose and, and demand higher uh, levels of, of freedoms? So let me start with, with religious uh uh, freedoms. Uh, I mentioned uh, about a half hour ago that uh, the Quran itself uh, is not an obstacle to religious freedoms, even broad religious uh, freedoms, because the Quran is subject to uh, interpretation and liberal interpretations of the uh, Quran exists. Liberal variants of Islam, uh, no, they do not exist. And that's that's a puzzle. Schisms have occurred in recent times uh, in Islam. Uh, ISIS was a uh, uh, schism. The Muslim Brotherhood uh, that I mentioned a moment ago in another context, it was established in the early 20th uh, century in Egypt. Like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, like uh, 
other such uh, uh, or other such new variants of Islam, they demand a stricter form of Islam, less permissive, more intolerant, more literal in its interpretation of uh, the Quran, more tied to uh, uh, the past and uh, giving individuals less uh, freedom to decide exactly how they're going to interpret the religion and how they're going to uh, live. Now, this is a, a puzzle because we look at uh, say Protestantism, we see uh, many schisms all of the time, and they're not. Some of them are uh, uh, schisms that demand more strictness; they are less uh, uh, permissive. But you also have schisms, as we're seeing currently among the Methodists. We're seeing among the Episcopalians, uh, Presbyterians, we have uh, we have uh, splits that uh, take uh, that uh, involve both new variants or new uh, uh, interpretations of Christianity that are stricter, but also ones that are that are less strict, that are more per permissive, more tolerant. And so with, with regard to, uh, in, in Protestantism, uh, uh, female uh, ministers or, or gay ministers, again, you have these, these splits often are triggered by uh, these types of, uh, uh, these types of uh, controversies. And you get schisms, about liberal schisms and uh, uh, less liberal or anti-liberal uh, uh, schisms. Judaism in the in the nineteenth century in uh, uh, Germany uh, uh, generated two schisms that were more permissive Jews that wanted a more permissive uh, interpretation of Judaism that would uh, that would allow them to integrate into uh, into mainstream uh, society, non-Jewish society. Uh, which would be convenient, of course, for uh, for business. That was Reform Judaism, and you also had partly as a reaction to, to that uh, Orthodox Judaism, which uh, demanded uh, more strictness, less integration into uh, into mainstream society, more more segregation in uh, in in living and and in, uh, and in lifestyles. Now, uh, why is this the case? Why do we have this asymmetry? Why is there not being uh, uh, a liberal variant of Islam? It's not for lack of demand. If you look at Iran, or you look at you look at Turkey, you look at uh, other countries, you see many people, a substantial share of society. Uh, depending on the issue, perhaps a majority of society that wants Islam to be reinterpreted, that rejects uh, Islamic rules, Islamic dress codes, for example, uh, or uh, Islamic restrictions on interests, that would be uh, another. And yet we don't get uh, a liberal variant. Now, the reason for this is that in the the uh, illiberal interpreters of Islam are not uh, averse to using force, and they believe that the religion gives them the right, in fact, the obligation to use force against anyone who exits the religion or anyone who is preaching a heresy, and a liberal form of Islam would be a form of heresy. Uh, if a group broke away from mainstream Islam to form, you know, Protestant Islam or, or another variant of Islam, you could pick your, uh, uh, your terminology, uh, they would feel justified in preventing them from doing so by, uh, by force. But the liberals 
by the very nature of liberalism, are averse to using force. They believe in in religious freedom. They uh, and uh, they don't believe they believe that people should be uh, should be free in deciding whether to be religious and if they're going to be religious, what religion they they join and their level of activity, the level of participation, whether they want to go to a uh, religious service or uh, or not. So this asymmetry, which is also connected to the weakness of civil society that I mentioned earlier, uh, explains why we haven't seen a liberal form of Islam. Organizations that could protect the right to form a uh, uh, um, uh, liberal form of Islam are not well organized and uh, uh, and uh, they don't have sufficient political clout to get the state to protect them. Now, uh, it, this comes as a surprise when I, uh, when I offer this uh, explanation, and of course in the book I go into much greater uh, detail, comes as a surprise to people who say, well, there was a, a long period in many countries of the Middle East when secularists were in charge. And in fact, ardent uh, secularists, Turkey, of course, at the most extreme, uh, uh, extreme version of this, where, uh, uh, where uh, uh, Islamic law was completely abrogated and uh, uh, there were efforts to, to drive Islam out of the public sphere. Uh, people uh, during the uh, presidencies of Ataturk and uh, Idunu, they for about 30 years, they, uh, uh, they were strongly discouraged from uh, bringing their religiosity into the public sphere. People uh, wearing religious signs, out, like yeah, the religious dress were not allowed in public buildings and schools, uh, etc. Now, what the secularists did was to repress religion. They did not try to reinterpret religion. And part of this because, was because the secularists, whether talking about the, uh, uh, the Turkish secularists or the Pahlavis in Iran or Bogiba in Tunisia or the leaders of Syria and Iraq, they were essentially irreligious people, or they were just nominal Muslims, and they expected, under the influence of modernization theory, for religion to essentially fade in importance as it was already in, in Europe. And they thought, you know, if we just repress Islam for the time being, Eventually, it will cease to be a uh, it will cease to be a problem, and then we can, of course, we can liberalize because it won't be uh, won't be an issue. Well, what happened instead is that their repression generated a great deal of resentment, and that resentment fueled reactions, and that's modern Islamism. And modern Islamism has, of course, facilitated the rise of more stricter, less tolerant uh, versions of Islam. And it has uh, allowed states, because they have captured states, as in, as in Turkey now, as in, as in Iran, as in various uh, where it's other places, they, have, uh, they are, uh, are uh, not facilitating and in fact, preventing the emergence of uh, uh, liberal forms of uh, forms of, of Islam. Now, uh, so uh, let me move to the uh, second part of your question uh, briefly. The uh, uh, just as the Waqf, which was an economic organization that had massive political consequences. Uh, there are other Islamic 
uh, institutions historically that had huge uh, economic consequences over the long run that contributed to economic and underdevelopment that also contributed to political underdevelopment in that the, the uh, uh, continuation of uh, 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 various forms of uh, repression. Uh, Islamic partnerships, uh, for one of these, Islamic partnerships uh, constituted an advanced uh, an advanced uh, form of uh, or uh, type of uh, or vehicle of cooperation in the uh, Middle Ages, uh, but they, uh, in the long run, they blocked economic uh, development because they uh, Islamic partnerships were small and simple, and they could not grow over time because of another. Uh, Islamic organization, the Islamic Inheritance System, which is highly egalitarian, Islamic, uh, a, any uh, one who uh, who formed, uh, who accumulated a lot of wealth, saw that wealth get subdivided after him, so you didn't get the capital accumulation that emerged in uh, that uh, uh, occurred in Europe, and in the absence of capital. Uh, Accumulation uh, uh, organizations had uh, did not grow, and there was no need to develop more advanced institutions, more advanced forms of uh, of uh, uh, merging capital and uh, labor in a single organization uh, uh, to uh, take advantage of economies of scale and. Well, in the absence of uh, large organizations, uh, business associations, large and and durable organizations, no business associations formed. And without business organizations, uh, the merchants and other members of the collective of the commercial uh, sector did not become a political force. In Europe, merchants by Forming political organizations eventually, uh, 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 eventually got political power. They got they got to sit in in parliament. There's nothing similar to this in the Middle East. To compound the problem, there wasn't the option in the Middle East of establishing corporations, because as I mentioned, there's no corporate uh, uh, law. So uh, that also kept merchants from becoming a uh, political uh, force. So uh, this is just one of the institutions, one of the economic institutions, uh, the, the partnership that, uh, uh, that uh, kept the Middle East economically underdeveloped, but it also contributed to the, uh, the weakness of civil society and uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, failure to develop checks and institutional checks and balances had merchants uh, been able to form business associations, they would have put pressure on the uh, on the state. They would have made the state accept various uh, constraints. Let me take this conversation to. To the present and 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 i would like to close maybe by trying to extract the lessons to today from from your book and probably a good way of doing that is of, of doing that is asking you about your your thoughts about the region are you optimistic in terms of uh the expansion of this uh freedoms how, how do you see the landscape i guess that it's quite heterogeneous probably you'd have some specific thoughts about turkey that seems probably to be moving away from a liberal environment what uh, what's your perspective uh, uh, for the region so in in the short run uh i'm i might say that i'm pessimistic about the sh short uh, in the, the near future I don't think there's any quick fix. I don't think that there's, you know, any any button we can turn or law that we can pass that will 
suddenly uh, uh, generate in one part of the region or another uh, uh, sustainable democracy and and uh, 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 sustainable liberal order. I don't think that's uh, the case. On the other hand, I think that liberalization is a possibility, and I think that the events in of the last uh, half century in uh, the trajectories of Turkey, Iran, to an extent Saudi Arabia, uh, I think are getting the region closer to liberalization because uh, they uh, the it, they are generating increasing growing disillusionment with Islam, not the religion per se or necessarily, but with various types of repression conducted in the name of Islam and all the corruption that goes with it, all the corruption that the repression uh, allows and uh, that it uh, allows by preventing people from objecting to uh, objecting to the corruption and uh, reforming the, uh, the system. Uh, religiosity is declining in the uh, in Turkey, religiosity is declining uh, substantially in uh, Iran. We know that this is happening in Saudi Arabia also. We know that it's happening in, in Egypt. And we know that it's quite substantial from reports, leaked reports that have been prepared by uh, uh, religious uh, the states religious organizations or uh, like Turkey's uh, religious affairs uh, directorate or by or at major uh, religious uh, seminaries like uh, uh, like uh, Al-Azhar in, in Egypt. They point to a growing share of even their own graduates who have quietly exited Islam for either deism or, in some cases, uh, in in special special share of cases, of uh, atheism, and in a much smaller uh, in sm much smaller share in other uh, the religions. They're quite alarmed by this. They're and in response, they're trying to tighten the screws and uh, and uh, increase the uh, the number of religion courses students have to take, uh, increasing various uh, uh, or tightening various uh, religious uh, rules, monitoring people, or as, as in the case of uh, Iran now, the religious police is trying to crack down on women who are who refuse to wear the, uh, the veil. Uh, but uh, I think that they're, they're all of these measures are going to be unsuccessful. They are just going to increase the disillusionment. And when you have the disillusioned people and their numbers grow sooner or later, it's going to have political effects. Sooner or later, they're going to succeed in forming an alternative or an alternative variant of uh, uh, the religion. This, and we've seen this in Europe, you know, the, the church in Rome resisted uh, movements to reform uh, the church for a number of some hundreds of years. But eventually we got, of course, the Protestant Reformation and, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, there have been many, uh, many reforms since. So I think this is this is uh, going to. It's just a matter of time. This is going to happen in in the region. I think that uh, liberalization can start anywhere in in the system. Uh, it can it can start uh, the intellectual uh, liberalization and then eventually uh, affect uh, religion, affect affect the economic uh, system, affect the political system, its starting point can also be uh, a religion. 
And I think in in the Middle East at the moment, the more li- most likely place where you will get uh, 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 an important liberalization movement that then becomes contagious is religion. And I expect that by, by two candidates for where such a movement would begin would be Iran and Turkey, both countries with uh, with quite substantial uh, uh, secular populations, irreligious or nominally religious uh, populations that are uh, sooner or later going to uh, get organized and strike. That will then start uh, uh, generate a great deal of thinking within society about freedoms in general. And uh, it would not, uh, nowhere in the region would they be starting from scratch. Uh, nowhere would they be uh, trying to uh, establish checks and balances from uh, from scratch. Uh, the region is better off than the, uh, than the early 20th century in that. Uh, sense. This is fascinating. I feel that uh, I should invite you for many more episodes to uh, talk about many more things, but uh, we're running out of time. Thanks a lot. This was uh, a fantastic conversation. I learned a lot from your book, which is being released now in the US, right? It, it has now been released in the in the entire world. Uh, the United States was uh, was among the last countries but it, it is available uh, now for immediate shipment it's available as an ebook as well that's that's great well yeah. let me thank you again and i hope to to see you soon thank you Javier.